Tonight's message in Jeremiah chapter 5 through 6, I've entitled it, oh, what, something happened to the title. <laughs> Basically, um, with correction, correction brings, brings grace. Correction brings grace. You know, we live in a corrupt world. And the Bible truly does explain to us that this world is a sinful place, is it not? Before I knew Christ, I did not understand what it meant by being a sinful place. I, I didn't understand the definition of sin. I knew there was evil, and usually I would associate evil with like murderers, you know, uh, thieves, uh, terrorists, those type of things. And I thought those are evil people. Or somebody at work that you didn't get along with, you would say they're evil. But as far as sin, I, I had no definition for sin. I didn't understand the concept of sin itself. Becoming a Christian, now I understand the concept of sin. That it's not necessarily uh, sin is for those extreme murderers and terrorists, but I'm a sinner. By nature, I'm a sinner. I have a tendency to wander off a tendency of being rebellious that's in my nature. And so there's a battle that's going on constantly. And part of that battle is correction, where the Lord comes into my life and corrects me where I'm wrong. Now we can receive correction in two different ways, right? We can receive correction as, as far as from a brother or a sister, from the Lord, or from reading the scriptures, correction can come. And that's a good thing. Uh, Proverbs tells us that... Um, that a friend uh, will rebuke you. And, and if you receive rebuke, then you, you become wiser, it also says. But we can also receive correction in a negative way by thinking that someone's judging us. You know, while you're judging me, you think that you're better than me, you think that you know better than me, and so we receive it in a negative way. In fact, we don't even receive it at all. Or we can receive correction understanding that God is bringing about grace in our lives. And that's really how we need to receive correction, that God is bringing his grace into our lives. I didn't understand that in the beginning. It's taken me a while to understand that. Being um, an individual that was very much in control of my life from the beginning, <clears throat> A-type personality, needed to be in control of everything, and needed to have an understanding of what was going on. I'm very much organized, A, B, C, D. And if one of those are out of place, i got to go back and, and get that one in place. Uh, you may even notice it now, and I'm picking it up even more and more, that, that when I'm walking by things at the house or in my room or even here at the church, I'm always moving things so they're, they're all in line. You know, I notice that even more. So being that type of person, um, I needed a lot of correction as I was aging from the age of 20 to, to about 50. <laughs> it's taken me a long time. And, and there's still a lot more, more correction that needs to take place. Uh, had a hard life, you know, in my relationship with my wife. Had a hard life in relationships, uh, period. And I've learned that in those corrections, the Lord has brought about grace in my life. I've lost relationships, you know, because of my sin and, and other sins, but, but he's brought grace in my life through it all. And I think that because of God's grace in his correction, I've become the better person through Jesus Christ, not of my own works or my own strength, but because God has been so patient with me. Not necessarily people, but God has been patient with me and gracious with me, along with my wife being very patient uh, through the correction and then God bringing about grace. I don't know if that makes any sense to you right now, some of you, but it will later on down the road as you continue to seek the Lord in, in His grace. His grace is an awesome thing. It's amazing how much favor He has towards us. And so tonight, we look at God's correction in the life of the children of Israel, and yet his correction brings about grace in their lives. He really wants to show them that grace. We studied Monday night uh, Galatians, and we, I gave a, gave a little overview of uh, God's grace and law. And if you picture Genesis through Revelation, you know that in the beginning, God started with grace, right? 
God walked with Adam and Eve, and he walked with Adam and Eve by grace, all the way up until where? Mount Sinai, right? All the way to Moses. And then all of a sudden the law came in, and Paul tells us the law came in because of transgression. So men were transgressing, and they didn't know it, and so God needed to let them know they were sinners, and so he created the law. And so the Ten Commandments came into existence to show them that they were transgressors, that they didn't keep the Sabbath, they didn't honor their father and mother, they, they lied to their uh, neighbors and their friends, and they stole and all those things. And then the law came in there at Moses, and it lasted all the way till when? Till Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ came, and he brought about grace once again. What God intended for us was grace, but then the law came in to reveal that we couldn't live by a law but with it, we needed more grace, and then Jesus comes and gives us grace again. And so grace is a wonderful thing. And so God is dealing with the children of Israel according to the law. And they're being disciplined according to the law. But he really wants to pour grace on them. God's heart is a heart of grace towards our lives. And we should have that same grace for one another. We see here in chapter 5 the hardness of the children of Israel. Their hearts are hard towards God. Uh, They have become hardened because of their sin, because of their rebellion, and because God is now correcting them, they become rebellious against that correction and they harden their heart towards God. We see that in the scriptures it talks about a backsliding individual and we see that in the life of Peter and how he backslid from the Lord. Uh, there uh, when they took Jesus uh, from the garden and those steps that he took to backslide from the Lord. He was uh, confronted, first of all, uh, that he knew Jesus. And of course he said, no, I don't know Jesus. That's that's hardening his heart. And and then again, it was confronted. Your language is just like Jesus. No, you know, I I don't know the man. I don't really told you that. And, And it hardened his heart even more. And then the last was, no, you are one of them. We've seen you with them. And then again, he cursed and he said, no, I don't know the man. And he hardened his heart. There's steps to backsliding. You know, whether it was fear in his life that he was fearful that they would find out that he would then uh, be crucified or or put on trial or whether it was selfishness, you know, uh, all of those things harden our hearts. And so their hearts were hardened and mostly because of sin. They began to separate themselves from God and seek after other idols. And though they did, so they didn't need God, nor a relationship with God, because they had their idols, they had their life, and so they were hardened to the Lord. And so the Lord says in verse 1, run to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem. Now he's speaking to Jeremiah. See now and know, and seek in her open places, if you can find a man, if there is anyone who executes judgment, who seeks the truth, and I will pardon her. And so God immediately asked Jeremiah here in chapter 5 to go run to and fro into the streets and look for anyone that has a heart for me. Anyone that, that is open to truth. Anyone that is willing to execute judgment on my behalf. Anyone. And if you find such a man, then I will pardon her. The nation. Now God knew that there was not a man out there because they were all into idolatry and he's going to explain that here in a minute. Not just the people but also the leadership were also corrupt and wicked. And so uh, he was in a sense making a point to the children of Israel that nobody, nobody uh, was righteous at that point. They were all into idolatry. It says, though they say, as the Lord lives, surely they swear falsely. And so these people would say, but the Lord lives. God is good. God is great. God's grace is upon us. But yet, he says, they are swearing falsely. Now, what does he mean by that? It seems like they're just saying words, but they don't really believe it in their hearts. We mentioned it last week in Mark. Jesus said of the religious leaders, they profess to know me, but their hearts are far from me. And then you have the example that Jesus gave when, when, um, <clears throat> when he said that they'll come knocking on my door and I will open and say, I don't know you, even though they may call me Lord, Lord, and we've even done these things in your name. And yet he will say, I don't know you. Depart from me, workers of iniquity. 
That's the key. Workers of iniquity, they continue to practice sin in their lives. Their works were works of righteousness, self-righteousness. And even though it was done in the name of the Lord, it's sad. Their hearts were far from him. And so what these people were doing was saying, yeah, God lives. God is wonderful. God is great. But they really didn't believe it in their hearts. They really didn't believe it in their hearts. That's faith in action. When, when our faith is in God, then, then really we activate it, and God then begins to work in our lives. But when we don't have faith in God, when we don't believe God at his word, then he can't activate it. I see that a lot in counseling, in relationships. I see it in our daily walks. I see it in my own life at times when something seems to be um, too difficult for me and so I think God, it's too difficult for God, and so I don't think he can do that, and so I don't believe it. Though I know he said it, and I know he's capable of doing it, but for some reason, I don't believe it. I really don't believe it. And I'm trying to change that, and we need to try to change that in our relationships. We need to believe that the word of God is true. If God created the heavens and earth, as it says in Genesis, then we should believe everything else, right? And if he really did create the heavens and the earth then we should believe everything else he spoke them into existence did he not do that it says he did it did he not tell jonah to go and preach to nineveh because they would repent he said that they would and yet he rebelled and didn't believe or didn't want it to happen and so he was swallowed by a whale or a fish a big fish do we believe that he was swallowed by a fish Well, that's a little outlandish. I'm not sure if I believe that. Maybe that was more a metaphor. No, he was swallowed by a fish, the Bible says. Jesus even confirmed that in the New Testament that he was swallowed by a fish. And so we need to believe what the Word of God says with our minds and then also with our hearts. Believe it. And if there's any disbelief, then we need to confess that to the Lord and say, Help my disbelief, Lord. Help my disbelief. And God then understands that and he begins to work. These people, were, yeah, God is Jehovah. God lives. He's alive. He's powerful. But they were just swearing falsely. They really did not believe it. Verse 3, O Lord, are not your eyes on the, on the truth? This is Jeremiah speaking. Are your eyes not on the truth? You have stricken them, but they have not grieved. You have consumed them, but they have not They have refused to receive correction. They have made their faces harder than rock. They have refused to return. They were stubborn, weren't they? I I remember um, going to, I think it was Stater Brothers here, and uh, we were shopping. This was years ago, and I remember this little situation where this little kid, probably a two-year-old right around there, terrible twos, right? He wanted something, and so he went and grabbed it, and he put it in the cart, and the mom says, no, you can't have that, and put it back on the, on the shelf. And then he went back and grabbed it and put it back in the cart, and she says, no, you can't have that, and put it back on the shelf. Finally, he just started crying. And then he fell to the floor, and she's standing there, and he's screaming and yelling at her, kicking his feet and hitting the floor with his hands, and he's just stubborn, and he won't stop. And she's like, get up, come on, get up, get up, get up. And he continued to do it. Until she finally picked him up and he's all wilted, screaming and yelling and kicking. And then finally put him in the car. He's still screaming and yelling. Stubborn, stubborn. That's stubbornness. Now, as adults, we're a little more sophisticated (laughs) than that. We don't like to show that we're stubborn. But in our hearts, we're very stubborn. That is pride. That is pride when we get stubborn like that. Um, Jeremiah comments to the Lord, you know the truth, Lord. You know that they're, they're not grieved over their sins. They're not grieved at all. Sin should grieve us. Uh, when we sin or we see sin, it should grieve us. It should upset us in our lives. And not just the sin of others, but our own sin in our own lives. They refuse to receive correction, Lord. You know that. Uh, you're correcting them and they refuse to do it. Oh, they're confessing it, but they're not really changing. And they don't want to change. And their hearts are hardened. They're hardened towards you, and you know all this, Lord. Therefore, verse 4, I said, Surely these are poor. They are foolish, for they do not know the way of the Lord. 
the judgment of their God. I will go to the great men and speak to them, for they have known the way of the Lord, the judgment of their God. But these have all together broken the yoke and burst the bonds. And so the Lord basically says, look, uh, these uneducated Jews are foolish people. They don't understand. And so what I'll do is I'll go to the educated, the, the wise, the one that's been around a long time, the priests who are in charge and so forth. I'll go to them and they'll definitely understand. And yet, they won't. <laughs> Even the wise and the old are just as much sinners as the young. See, the Bible's clear that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It doesn't matter how old you are. Sin is sin, and it's in your life. It will consume you. We need to be open to the Lord and to his wisdom and to understanding. So even the old wise man refused to return to the Lord. Therefore a lion from the forest shall slay them. A wolf of the desert shall destroy them. A leopard will watch over their cities. Everyone who goes out from there shall be torn in pieces because their transgressions are many. Their backsliding have increased. How shall I pardon you for this? You, your children have forsaken me and sworn by those that are not gods. When I had fed them to the full, then they committed adultery and assembled themselves by troops in the harlot's house, houses. They were like well-fed, lusty stallions. Every one nighed after his neighbor's wife. Shall I not punish them for these things, says the Lord? Shall I not avenge myself on such a nation as this? What a sad thing to take place. It sure does remind us of our society today, doesn't it? I mean, this nation Israel was so hardened to the Lord, and yet they were prospering, they were being fed, the Lord was providing. And what did they do? They repaid them by sinning by going after their neighbor's wives, by committing idolatry and so forth. That sometimes goes along with riches, doesn't it? The richer you get, the more you have, the more that you can do with it. have to be careful. That's why not too many are rich, because the Lord knows it can corrupt us. I'm glad I'm not rich. It would corrupt me. We need to use the riches for the Lord. When, when you're well off, when you're wealthy, you know, it brings more sin into your life and you have to be very cautious over it. When you're full, when you're satisfied, a lot of times there's idle time. Uh, David had idle time uh, there in, during the kingdom when kings uh, should have been out battling. He was there on the rooftop and there was Bathsheba and he sinned. That's why we need to stay busy with the Lord. Merciful judgments, though, come upon the children of Israel. It's interesting here, God's correcting them, and it's pretty graphic that he's going to allow Babylon to come in and pretty much chastise them, but yet at the same time, it will be a limited judgment. There's mercy behind that judgment, and thus we have the correction that brings grace. And we see God trying to to shine forth some light in this dark judgment that's coming upon them in his grace. He says, go up uh, on her walls and destroy, but do not make a complete end. Don't utterly destroy. Kind of like God when he told Satan, look, you can take away things from Job, but don't touch Job. God puts the limit. God restricts the enemy or the enemies uh, from his children. Take away her branches, for they are not the Lord's. For the house of Israel and the house of Judah have dealt very treacherously with me, saith the Lord. How sad. Here you can be so rebellious against God. Uh, he says it's treachery, and you're, that you're treating God in a very, very negative way, and yet he can still have this desire to pour forth mercy towards you. That's a wonderful God to have. I love that God. That he is so merciful and gracious towards us, even though we are not. And so when Paul says in Romans that even though, even while we were yet still sinners, Christ died on the cross for us. Even when we were in rebellion against him, he died on the cross for us. That is great love. That is great love. And that's the love that I want, and that's the love that I want to give. 
For the house of Israel and the house of Judah have dealt treacherously with me, with me, saith the Lord. They have lied about the Lord and said, It is not he, neither will evil come upon us, nor shall we see sword or famine. So this prophecy came, the judgment was coming in, in the chapters earlier, and they're basically saying, No, that's not the Lord. That's a lie. He's, his judgment isn't coming. Kind of like what we saw on... Um, Sunday, right? Those coffers, you know, judgment isn't coming. That's a lie. You know, it's been 30 years. And so these people are also saying the same thing. No, judgment isn't coming. Everything is prospering. We're having a great time. You know, we're being fed, prosperity. I mean, I don't see any judgment coming at all. And God says, no, it's coming. You're calling me a liar. It's coming upon you. And the prophets become win for the word is not in them. Thus says it shall be done to them. Therefore, thus says the Lord God of hosts, because you speak this word, behold, I will make my words in your mouth fire, and this people would, and it shall devour them. Behold, I will bring a nation against you from afar, O house of Israel, says the Lord. It is a mighty nation. It is an ancient nation, a nation whose language you do not know, nor can you understand what they say. Their quiver is like an open tomb. They are all mighty men. A, a quiver was usually a, a carrying case where you would put it over your shoulder and you'd put your arrows in there. And so you had a, a quiver full of uh, arrows with you so that you can uh, fight your enemy. And in this case, what he's saying is their quiver uh, is just an open, empty tomb. And they're going to be destroyed from these mighty men. And they shall eat up your harvest and your bread, which your sons and daughters shall, should eat. They shall eat up your flock and your herds. They shall eat up your vines and your fig trees. They shall destroy your four to five cities in which you trust with the sword. Nevertheless, in those days, saith the Lord, I will not make a complete end of you. Boy, even with all of that, I will still not make a complete end with you. That's grace. That's mercy. That is our God. We've made decisions maybe in our lives that haven't been great ones. And we're suffering the consequences of those decisions. And they could be horrendous. And yet, if we humble ourselves before the Lord and recommit our lives to God... He can do a work of grace in your life. He can begin to use you once again. But you have to make the choice to be used of the Lord and to separate yourself from your old life to a new life and say, from this point on, I will serve the Lord. Now, there will always come opposition with that because everyone knows you. We're not liked in our own household, right, the Bible says, you know, because our family knows us. (laughs) They know how we are. They know our ins and outs, you know. They know our struggles even. And so our own household won't like us. But if we commit ourselves to the Lord and be faithful to the Lord, he can take those mistakes, he can take those decisions, he can turn it around, and he can have mercy on us. He won't make a complete end of us. He's writing a book he's the author and finisher of our faith he's an author and there's a chapter in your life that wasn't so good and so now you have an opportunity to make the next chapter better to allow him to write his plan and purpose in your life whatever that is for this life but you have to start over by committing yourself to him and allowing him to be your lord and savior And you see that in the New Testament all over. When Jesus comes into town and he begins to reach out. There were ten leopards. And he came to them. And their life was a life of leprosy. Uh, They were outcasts. They were separated from society. Uh, They lived in their own little place. People could not touch them. When, When people walked by them, they would scream and yell, unclean, unclean. How would you like to live a life like that? And then Jesus comes along. And he heals them. He he takes away this reproach. He takes away this sin. And he restores them. And then we have a choice. It says that one leopard came back to him. 
and received him as Lord. The nine went on with life. (laughs) Nine, right? Nine just said, thank you, Lord, see you later. And they continued on living their life. Boy, broad is a way to destruction, and narrow is a way to eternal life. And that one leopard came to receive grace and mercy in his life, and he was appreciative and thankful to the Lord. The Lord is known to do that. He can change your old life. He can even change your Christian life, your Christian life, and turn it around to be a better Christian life. Because there are a lot of Christians that aren't living right. They're in the world, and they're worldly Christians. And they made bad decisions, and they're not letting God be the Lord of their lives. And yet, God can have mercy on them. He doesn't want to completely turn them over to the enemy. He's a God that does not forsake us. And it will be when you say, why does the Lord our God do all these things to us? Then you shall answer them, just as you have forsaken me and served foreign gods in your land, so shall or so you shall serve aliens in the land that is not yours. Isn't that interesting? The very sin that they're committing will be their punishment. Here they're worshiping idols and not worshiping God. And so then God is going to say, you have forsaken me. And so I'm going to give you to a people that, that will in bondage you, that will be your masters, one that you will not understand completely. And you will serve these foreign gods in the land because they had no fear of the Lord. Look at verse 20. Declare this in the house of Jacob and proclaim it in Judah saying, Hear this now, O foolish people, without understanding, who have eyes and not see or see not, and who have ears and hear not. Do you not fear me, says the Lord? Will you not tremble at my presence? Who have placed the sand as a bound of the sea by a perpetual degree that it cannot pass beyond. And though its waves toss to and fro, yet they cannot prevail. Though they roar, yet they cannot pass over it. They did not have reverence for God. They did not fear God or his presence. You remember when the children of Israel came to Mount Sinai and they heard the roaring on the mountain and they were fearful and they told Moses, you go and see what's going on. We'll stay back here. That's reverence for the Lord. They knew that the Lord was holy and pure, that they really had no righteousness to even approach him, let alone request anything of him. And they had lost that to where they no longer feared him. And thus, Where's the judgment of God? It's not coming. Oh, I can get away with this, you know. And, and, and look, I've been getting away with it for quite a while now, and God hasn't done anything. And so he's not really upset at me. He might be upset with some other people, but I think this is okay because I don't see his judgment coming. And that's no reverence for God. And it's coming, and you'll be surprised when it comes. Now, it's interesting here that, that he says, that he's the one that sets the boundaries for the ocean. I thought that was interesting. Uh, that right where the ocean stops, it's because he has set that bound. And whether the, the waves are roaring, whether the waves are crashing, he sets the boundaries. Once in a while, he, he kind of extends those boundaries, right? When hurricanes come. And he says, okay, I'm going to allow a tsunami to come and just wash the whole land and cleanse it a little bit. You know, that's his boundaries. I'm going to talk a little bit more on this on, on Sunday, I was going to share with you a little bit uh, tonight, but, but we just uh, uh, got some news in June that they found water in the crust of the earth. And so I'm going to share, share with you a little bit more on this, which I think is evidence to um, evidence that proves that there was a global flood uh, that took place on our earth. But look that up if you want to uh, before, but we'll talk at length uh, on it. It's just interesting how God controls everything, even the ocean, you know. And yet we don't trust him. We don't believe him at his word. And yet the earth continues to spin. 
and rotate around the sun and the planets and gravity and all those things, and yet we struggle trusting and having faith in him. But this people have, has a defiant and rebellious heart. They have revolted and departed. They do not say in their hearts, let us now fear the Lord our God, who gives rain both the former and the latter in its seasons. He reserves for us the appointed weeks of the harvest. He goes on and says, your iniquities have turned these things away and your sins have withheld them uh, these goods from you. And so here we see the repercussion of sin, right? It, it always costs. The wages of sin is death, the Bible says. But here, the reason that these things were withheld from them was because of their sin. Now we talked again on Monday about this grace and, and the aspect of grace and how grace works. But yet, while there's grace, there's still repercussions of sin. We can sin... And live in sin and still have grace. We can still have grace because we're still breathing, first of all. That's God's grace. He should destroy us for the sin that we commit. But yet he doesn't. We continue to have work. We continue to be blessed in our families. We continue to um, enjoy life and so forth. Yet we're sinning. And yet there's grace. But... What a man sows, he also reaps. With that sin comes consequences. And so you may still be breathing, you may still be prospering at a certain point, to a certain point, but there's consequences for your sin. That's another subject. And so the wages of sin is death. When we continue to sin, things are withheld from us. Life, prosperity, blessings from the Lord. He limits what he can do in your life because of your sin. That's why Paul said, don't quench the spirit of God because then the power of the Holy Spirit is unable to work in your life. These are fearful things that we need to understand and yet we can still have God's grace in our lives. Understand that. And so confess it before the Lord, this iniquity, and ask him to help you to conquer it so that you're not practicing it. For among my people are found wicked men. They lie in wait as one who sets snares. They set a trap and catch men. As a cage is full of birds, so their houses are full of deceit. Therefore they have become great and grown rich. They have grown fat. They are sleek. Yes, they surpass the deeds of the wicked they do not plead the cause, the cause of this, the fatherless, yet they prosper, and the right of the needy they do not defend. Shall I not punish them for these? I was just listening to another uh, video with this Jose guy who says he's Jesus. Well, apparently he asked his followers to go out because it was celebrate Jesus Day type of thing and so he asked his followers to go out and tattoo on their bodies 666 because he said I'm the Antichrist and so hundreds if not thousands of people are tattooing 666 on their bodies and so they asked him he said what's this about I thought you were you said you were Jesus I am Jesus remember Jesus said he's going away and he's coming back but different I'm back that's me he says, but Antichrist means the opposite of Jesus. No, no, that's a wrong definition. Anti means different. I'm different. Jesus is in me. And so that's 666. And I'm like, God, this is crazy. And this guy is rich and wealthy. Last year, something like $1.6 million he brought in you know, for himself, fat. And God says, you're going to be judged for this. How can someone believe something like that? And then how can someone believe in someone like that? That is just really crazy. And then for him to be able to get them to do this by requesting that they do it and they go and do it, that's even crazier. Uh, when the news uh, reporters asked him, uh, people are worried about your control over people. He says, oh, yeah, I hear that all the time. They think I'm going to go and ask them to drink Kool-Aid and we're going to all die, millions of people. I would never do that. I would never do that. I, I came to bring them prosperity. You know, sounds good. You know, and they buy it. They buy it. But that's how cunning and deceitful they are. 
He says, shall I not punish them for these things, says the Lord? Shall I not avenge myself on such a nation as this? An astonishing and horrible thing has been committed in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests rule by their own power, and my people love to have it so. But what will you do in the end? Isn't that amazing? The prophets who are supposed to prophet, uh, prophesy the word of the Lord and nothing else are prophesying falsely. The priests who are to offer up the offerings and so forth are ruling by their own power without God. These are religious leaders who are ruling and reigning in their own strength and power, but without the guidance of the Lord, and the people want it so. Uh, one of, the, one of the, uh, the people that believed in this guy uh, claiming to be Jesus, he is, she was actually, I think, a, if I remember correctly, a, a daughter of his. And she said, oh, I love it, because G- Jesus is reigning with us on this earth, and there is no sin. We can enjoy life. And that makes sense. Yeah. The people want it that way. Yeah, I want a life where there's no sin. I can do whatever I want and there is no sin. In fact, we know Joel Osteen and others will talk about the fact that um, we don't want to talk about sin because we don't want to make people feel bad. We want to talk about God's prosperity. We want to motivate them in the right way. The people so... Now, why are these leaders like this? Because the people want it that way. It's the culture dictating the leadership. That's why. And it should be the other way around. Corruption is everywhere, isn't it? The leaders should make a stand. And they should um, stand by it. I had a little discussion with my granddaughter a month ago or so. About stubbornness. That I was a little stubborn. And most of you probably already know that, that, that know me, that I'm, a, I'm stubborn when it comes to certain things. And Virginia put it so well, says, no, he's not stubborn. He stands by his convictions. He stands by his convictions. And that is exactly what a leader should do. Stand by his convictions. What he believes the word of God is saying. And I don't blame a man that stands by those convictions. If he's correct from the word of God, he has every right to be stubborn and stand by his convictions. That's the kind of man and leader that that you want leading you. Not one that you can manipulate and sway to your way, but one that will stand for righteousness and not sway one way or the other. Now we come to chapter 6. As... Jeremiah has predicted the judgment of God upon them. And this message has been going on all the way from chapter 3 all the way to chapter 6 here. Uh, He's going to end it, this judgment call upon them. And he warns them here in chapter 6 with the trumpet sound. O you children of Benjamin, gather yourselves to flee from the midst of Jerusalem. Uh, Blow the trumpets in Tekoa and set up the signal fire in Beth Hachiram. For disaster appears out of the north and great destruction. I have likened the daughter of Zion to a lovely and delicate woman. The shepherds and their flocks shall come to her. They shall pitch their tents against her all around. And each one shall pasture in his own place. Prepare war against her. Arise and let us go up at noon. Woe to us for the day goes away. For the shadows of the evening are lengthening. Arise and let us go by night. And let us destroy her places. For for thus has the Lord of hosts said... Cut down trees and build a mount against Jerusalem. The, the reason for the cutting down of trees was, was for them to have material to make their weapons. You know, their, their, their um, what do you call those things that they can knock down the, uh, wo- the doors and, and catapults and arrows and whatever weapons that they need. So cut them down and build a mount against Jerusalem. This is the city to be punished She is full of oppression in her midst. As a fountain wells up with water, so she shall, so she wells up with her wickedness. Violence and plundering are heard in her. Before me continually are grief and wounds. 
Be instructed, O Jerusalem, lest my soul depart from you, lest I make you desolate, a land not inhabited. So the warning trumpet. <clears throat> and what he's saying there is with the trumpet and with the fire, there's signals that judgment is coming. They would use the trumpets to warn them for different things. Uh, they would sound a trumpet a certain way, so a certain amount of blast meant that the enemy was coming, uh, another blast that, that it's time to come back in, you know, just various reasons for blast. We have that even today. Uh, not Well, I think even in the United States, we probably have these sirens, but we just don't know it. But I think that um, you see it more like in Britain and Germany and all of those things. You hear these sirens just go off, meaning that, you know, an enemy is attacking or something uh, disastrous is coming, you know, a flood or things like that. And so these are all warning signs for them. And so Jeremiah is saying, get ready, it's coming. The trumpets are going to blow. And yet we see in verse 9, thus says the Lord of hosts, they shall thoroughly glean as a vine of remnant of Israel, as a grape gatherer puts your hand back into the branches. In other words, they're not going to listen and so Jeremiah describes that Babylon will come in and just glean them like a field. Just wipe them out, take them into captivity. To whom shall I speak and give warning that they may hear? Indeed, their ear is uncircumcised. Now there's that word uncircumcised. When you hear the word uncircumcised, it's speaking spiritually. Yeah, there's a covenant that God made with Abraham and, and at, at the eighth day a child was to be circumcised. It, it was a sign of a covenant. But God really said and intended the circumcision to be of the what? Heart. He wanted our hearts to be circumcised to the Lord. It's not the outward evidence. It's the heart being circumcised to the Lord. The covenant is in my heart. I will not break it because it is the heart that loves the Lord. It is the heart that we serve the Lord, not by our outward showing. And so when you get to Paul, and Paul talks about the uncircum or the circumcised, the religious leaders, it's because they follow the laws of God. And again, Paul said circumcision has no value at all. What has value is the new creation, that is a new heart, a new heart. God works in our hearts to create in us a new heart, you know, that's the sign of our salvation is that we have a new heart, that we're born again, John said in chapter 3, that unless we're born again, we cannot enter the kingdom of God, that it's a spiritual birth that takes place in our hearts. There are many who call themselves Christians, but their hearts are not circumcised. Their hearts aren't anew. And Paul said, the old man passes away. Behold, all things become new. If your heart hasn't changed towards the Lord, if your heart hasn't become soft to the things of God and it's hard and towards God, then you need to ask God to soften your heart. He wants a soft heart, a circumcised heart, a sensitive heart to the Lord and not a hardened heart. Their ears were uncircumcised. In other words, they wouldn't hear. They didn't want to hear. I think of teenagers. I remember being a teenager and how my mom would say things or my dad would say things and I didn't hear. I had an uncircumcised hearing. It's called selective hearing. And it was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Went out the other ear. I didn't want to hear it because I had my own plan, wanted to do my own thing. And teenagers are that way. You know, they have it already set in their mind what is right for them, and they're not going to change it no matter what anyone says. Their, their hearing is uncircumcised. You know, unless they really want to hear and do what's right in that relationship with their parents. Their ears are uncircumcised and they cannot give heed. Behold, the word of the Lord is a reproach to them. <clears throat> In other words, they can't even stand the word of God. They have no delight in it. 
Therefore, I am full of the fury of the Lord. I am weary of holding it back. I pour it out on the children outside and on the assembly of the young men together, for even the husbands shall be taken with the wife and the aged with him who is full of days. And their houses shall be turned over to others, fields and wives together, for I will stretch out my hand against the inhabitants of the land, saith the Lord, because from the least of them... Even to the greatest of them, everyone is given to covetousness. And from the prophet, even to the priest, everyone deals falsely. They have also healed the hurt of my people. Slightly saying, peace, peace, when there is really no peace. And, and so judgment is coming. And all of them are given into this covetousness and this prosperous life. And I'm telling them judgment is coming because of their idolatry. And the people are saying, not really. There's really peace, peace. Everything's okay. Now, I know that we love hearing that. And I think that is why the preachers of today are so popular. Because they love hearing the fact that, hey, God wants you to prosper. And he wants you to have peace in your life. He wants you to be enjoying life itself because God wants you happy. And so we have these preachers saying this because people love hearing it. But life isn't that way, is it? Life isn't that way. There are so much struggles within families themselves. And we're seeing that within the Christian community, the struggles that are in some of the Christian leaders of today. That's typical. And I'll guarantee you, in this room alone, with the different families that are here, I'll guarantee you that every family is having difficulty in their lives. They might have some peace right now, but they're all having difficulty. I don't know of a family that's not having difficulty. Unrest, division, lack of trust, you know, complaints, one another, personality conflicts, all of those things, those are all part of our our families. And so what do we want? Peace. We want rest. And so we're always looking for that, always asking for God help us, you know, and so forth. How can I change? How can they change? What do they need to do? What do they have to do? Okay, you know, and we're grasping for that. And when people talk about it, we're listening because we want it. It's human nature to have that. But see, we forget this, that incorrection brings grace. That God is working in us and we're not looking at ourselves. We need to examine ourselves. We need to evaluate our own life. How are we living? You see, I have peace with the Lord because I know that I am going to live for Him no matter how anyone else is living. I'm going to serve Him because that's who I serve. I'm going to make my decisions based upon what I believe the Word of God says no matter what anyone else is telling me it says. But I know what it says. And thus I have peace in my life. And even though there might be storms all around me, I'm not going to give in to that. Yeah, it's difficult, but I'm going to continue to just trust in God for myself so that I can have that relationship with Him and be successful in that relationship, even though there's turmoil around us. Remember that little story of the little bird in the crevices of the rock? You know, and it shows them just uh, uh, singing a song and chirping away. And then all of a sudden, as they pull the camera away, he's actually in a rock by the ocean. And then you see the water crashing on the rock and and so forth. And all over the place, the white water. And and, and he's just in a tiny little hole in a rock, just peaceful, chirping away. And the rock represents Christ and how he is our rock. And we have peace in him. That's where the peace comes from. You're not going to find it in your wife. You're not going to find it in your children. You're not going to find it in your church or your leadership. You're only going to find it in Jesus Christ alone. Only in him will you have that peace and that rest. That's why Jesus said, come to me. All you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. It's in Jesus Christ and nothing else. And so when we make the proper choices and decisions to live our life by evaluating our personal life. That's where the peace and the rest comes in. 
<clears throat> it's when we begin to try to control other people's lives that we get into their drama because now they're into our drama and you can't do that. <clears throat> That's why Paul says, I don't even judge myself. And there were many men that judged Paul, you know, Pharisee of Pharisees. He's, he's lying. He's really not telling the truth here. He's just trying to get in, you know. Uh, <clears throat> he's not as righteous as you think he is. And, you know, and so Paul's saying, yeah, well, you know what? I don't even judge myself because I don't even know my own self. So I let God be the judge of that. I love that. Because then I can rest and have that peace in my life. Lord, you're my judge and no one else is. And you know my heart because you're God and no one else knows my heart. And so I can have rest and peace knowing that I, um, I'm okay with you because I'm doing the best I can and I believe I'm following your word to the best of my ability. And if every one of us would do that, there would be so much rest and peace in our life. It really would. We just get along a lot more. And when I say get along, it doesn't mean there's turmoil and storms around us. That's going to always happen because God is always working in our lives to correct us so that he can bring more grace in our lives. So even though all this was happening, the people were saying, no, there's peace, peace, where there is no peace. Were, were they ashamed when they had committed abominations? No, and we say, shame on you, and we're not ashamed. Yeah, but when you're in that much sin, and you're practicing it, and your heart is so hardened, yeah, there is no shame. They were not at all ashamed, nor did they know how to blush. <laughs> that is our society today, isn't it? I mean, that is, people don't even know how to blush anymore. There's no, I don't even know if people blush anymore. You go to high schools today, and some of the stuff that goes on over there, you go, how can teachers let kids get away with this stuff? They don't even blush. In other words, they're not ashamed. They don't feel embarrassed when they do something wrong at all. And that's you know, a sign of a hard heart. Therefore they shall fall among those who fall. At the time I punish them, they shall be cast down, says the Lord. Thus says the Lord, stand in the ways and see and ask for the old paths where the good ways is and walk in it. Then you will find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk in it. See, just walk in it. When you walk with the Lord and you're at peace with the Lord and you're walking in his ways, then there's rest for your life. There's rest for your life. Let God have everyone everyone else. He'll take care of them just as, as much as he'll take care of you. And by the way, and I've been really talking a lot about this at the men's study too, just because you have grace on people doesn't mean that you are approving of their lifestyle. Doesn't mean you're approving of it. You can be very clear, I don't approve of that lifestyle. The way that you're living is unacceptable to God. And you know it. But you continue to live it. But I still love you. And I'm still gracious towards you. But I don't approve of it. And you can do that. You have to separate the two. You're showing grace and love and mercy. Kindness and all those things. Because you're loving them. Corinthians. But you don't have to approve of how they're living. We're taking that to an extreme. Some of the churches where pastors now are saying, you know, homosexuals can be Christians. I think that we can have grace on them, but I think we can't approve what they're doing. And now we're having pastors approving it. I think we can love them and be kind. And I, and I don't mean to separate them as though there's something, you know, different. It's sin, whether it's alcoholism homosexuality, or any, any other type of sin. You can have grace and love and kindness and so forth, but you need to be clear, God does not approve of that lifestyle. But what pastors are doing now is, no, God loves you, and as long as you love God and there's love in your relationship, God accepts that, and that's not true. That's not true. And, and you're going to hear more about this. I, I just don't want to use the name right now because it's just so sensitive but somebody very, very famous has just um, basically turned that way that's in the Calvary Chapel movement. 
And it's sad because they're approving of the homosexual lifestyle now. And they're coming at it from the cultural perspective of feelings and emotions. You know, I've seen these people. And they love each other. And they call themselves Christians. And they're kind towards others. And they call themselves Christians. So why can't they be Christians? Because they're going to knock. And I'll open the door. And I'll say, you're a worker of iniquity. That's why. Because they're sinning against the Lord and His Word. Yes, they're going to call themselves Christians. Yes, they're doing the works of the Lord. Yes, they have compassion and love and kindness and all those things. But the Word of God says, if you're practicing iniquity, you cannot inherit the kingdom of God. And they're they're not being clear of that. So I set watchmen over them, saying, Listen to the sound of the trumpet, but they said, We will not listen. Therefore hear, you nations, and know, O congregation, what is among them. Hear, O earth, behold, I will certainly bring calamity on this people. Now, isn't that interesting that uh, Jeremiah says, okay, look, congregation, oh, wait, wait, you're not listening. Uh, Your ears are uncircumcised, so let me speak to the earth. Let me talk to the dirt. Let me talk to the ground, and let me tell them that, behold, certainly, I'm going to bring calamity on this people. The fruit of their thoughts, because they have not heeded my words nor my laws, but rejected it. For what purpose to me comes frankincense or Sheba? In other words, faithless works. They're just works. They're sacrifices that really are not done from the heart. And sweet cane from the far country or burnt offerings are, are not acceptable, nor your sacrifices sweet to me. I don't care how far you've gone. To get the sacrifice, your heart is uncircumcised. Therefore, thus says the Lord, behold, I will lay stumbling blocks before this people, and the fathers and the sons together shall fall on them. The neighbors and their friends shall perish. Thus says the Lord, behold, a people come from the north country, a great nation will, will be raised from the furthest part of the earth. They will lay hold on bow and spears. They are cruel and have no mercy. Your voices roar like the sea, or their voices roar like the sea, and they ride on horses as men of war set in array against you, O daughter of Zion. We have heard the report of it, our hands grow feeble. Anguish has, first, has taken hold of us. Pain as of a woman in labor. Do not go out into the field, nor walk in the way. Because the sword of the enemy, fear is on every side. O daughter of my people, dressed in sackcloth and roll about in ashes. In other words, begin to mourn and wail. Make mourning as far as for an only son. Most bitter lamentation for the plunders will suddenly come upon us. I have set you as a assayer and a fortress among my people that you may know and test their ways. And the Sarah was a metal uh, checker. You know, you, they would melt metal and they, they would then test the metals to see how pure it was and so forth. So he's telling Isaiah, I'm setting you as that metal checker, that tester, and you're going to test my people. And you'll see that they're stubborn. They are all stubborn, rebellious, walking as slanders. They are bronze and iron. They are all corruptors the billows blow fierce fearlessly the lead is consumed or the lead is consumed by the fire Uh, the the smolter refine in vain for the wicked are not drawn off people will call them rejected silver because the lord has rejected them you know what god was telling jeremiah your ministry is not going to be successful (laughs) That's what he was saying to him. You're going to say all these things, but these people are stubborn. They're not going to hear you. They're not going to hear you. And they didn't. How would you like to be in charge of an unsuccessful ministry? I don't think anybody wants to be in charge of an unsuccessful ministry. I don't think I would have liked it if God said, look, I've called you to a people, but they're never going to listen to you. I called you to a people and they're not going to really follow me at all. Oh, they're going to pretend to be righteous, you know, and all those things, but don't worry. 
they're not going to respond to you at all. I'm like, well, why am I doing this then? <laughs> I don't think I want this job, <laughs> Lord. <laughs> you know, why don't you find somebody else? You know, why don't you get a false prophet or a false teacher to come out here and lead false people that don't really want a relationship with you? That makes more sense. You know, poor Jeremiah. What a relationship. You know, it really ministers to me because it tells me that I'm not in control of the ministry. God is in control of the ministry. And he will prosper it if he wants to prosper it. And he will keep it where he wants it. And if he wants it small, it'll stay small. If he wants it big, it'll, it will be big. It all depends on him. And I've seen it all. I've seen pastors that aren't charismatic, and they have huge churches. And I've seen people that have been very charismatic, and they have small churches. You know, and you scratch your head, okay, what's going on here? And you try to figure it out, and you can't. And God has such a variety that, that, that you just can't figure out what he's doing. And I think he wants it that way. And we try to figure it out because what, what do we want? We want a big church. We all want a big church. We all want all the resources and so forth. It's nice to have those resources. You know, we're at a point as a church, as small as we are, but we have some resources. I think this is the first year that we have actually paid out more money for guests, speakers, or worship people to come out than ever before because we have the resources to now ask them to come out. Where in the past, I would never ask because I couldn't pay them anything. And so it would, it would have had to come from their heart just to do it for free. And so I, I really don't ask a lot of people to come out because I, I want to give them some of the uh, labors worthy of his hire. But once in a while, someone else will ask, you know, and I like it when someone else asks, and they kind of are on the spot, you know, hey, could you come out for free? And then I was like, hey, it wasn't me, it was them, they, they're the ones that asked. You know, but we've spent more money, and so I understand the more resources you have, the more freedom you have to be able to do different types of things. And we're kind of experiencing that to a little bit, you know, a little bit, not a whole lot, but it's nice. It's nice, and you want the church to grow, and then if it's not growing, what, what happens? We start blaming. What's the reason behind it? Is it the chairs? Let's get new chairs. Is it the paint? Let's get paint. Is it grass? Let's get some grass out there. Is it the pastor? Let's get a new one. Maybe we need a new one. You know, we go through all of these things. Is it Jeremiah? Maybe it's his words. Maybe he's a little harsh, you know, telling the people that his enemy's going to come in and wipe them all out like a vineyard that's on fire and consume them. Yeah, that's pretty harsh. Maybe he needs to little, calm down a little bit and share a little more love of God. You know, I try. I mean, this message was tough, and so I had to really, really think about correction brings grace. Grace is the positive aspect of it right you know and so i'm like okay we don't like correction but we like grace because that's favor of god and so i'm like okay how do i make this positive at the same time and yet understand that god corrects us as his children poor jeremiah his ministry was not successful so how did god judge jeremiah he judged him on his faithfulness to what God had told him to do in his ministry. You're a prophet of God. I've called you just to proclaim my word. Be faithful with that. They won't listen to you. Oh, they'll tell you, yeah, yeah, wonderful God. He's alive. But just be faithful to proclaim it. That's what the ministry is about, is being faithful to complain, com proclaim the word of God simply as it is written in the word of God.